Since its inception back in the 70s, Ultraride Aviation grew out of the need for something that the average person could afford to build, own, and fly. Its pioneers were normal people, ordinary people, like John Moody, Dick Kuyper, John Choyda, Bill Adaska, Mike Fisher, Jack McCormick, Larry Monroe, Bob Lovejoy, Chuck Sulorstein. These people designed their craft from scratch, built it from parts and pieces they were able to scrounge. They bore their technology from go-karts, bicycles, sailboats, chainsaws, snowmobiles, motorcycles. When they couldn't find what they needed, they designed and built it. They didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend. They were lucky if they had a hundred bucks. When you look back today, you realize that the people designing and building ultralights weren't centralized. They were all over the U.S. and Canada all linked together by one dream. The dream of safe, fun, affordable flying. In the early 80s, their dreams seemed to have been realized. Literally thousands of aircraft were being produced, not by one manufacturer, but by hundreds of small manufacturers, each building their own unique little designs. Some had the luxury of a small manufacturing facility, but the majority work from their garages and backyards. At shows like Sun and Fun and Oshkosh, pilots and manufacturers showed up in droves. In fact, there was so much interest that EAA even went so far as to consider having a show just for ultralights. There were magazine articles and popular mechanics, glider rider, home built aircraft, ultralight pilot, ultralight aircraft, to name a few. One year, the manufacturer of the Quicksilver line of ultralight aircraft was reported to have outsold all of the conventional aircraft manufacturers combined. So, how were these manufacturers so successful? The secret was affordability, quick builder assembly times, and the fact that ultralight aircraft were easy to fly. Add to this the ability to add things like floats, snow skis, and closed cabins, and you have the recipe, recipe for success. But these pilots weren't building aircraft to travel at over 100 miles per hour. They were building them to fulfill a wish to fly, not globally, but locally. They flew from backyard fields to farm fields, from grass strips to weekend fly-ins. Oh, they could travel 100 miles, but it was a full day adventure. Flying two and a half hours in the early morning, you get there with another two and a half hour flight later in the evening to get back. The success of the, sport pot of the sport was built into the system. For safe flying, you needed two place aircraft and instructors. So associations were formed. They took on the responsibility of ensuring that instructors had the necessary knowledge and experience to be able to teach under a two place training exemption. The instructors, in turn, were required to renew their memberships in the participating organization's training program. This money was then used by the organizations, in most cases, to promote the sport and upgrade the programs where needed. The cost was relatively cheap, with the instructor then able to get his money back by teaching students. At one time, the list of instructors in the U.S. was well over 500 representing just about every state on the map. Even at four or five students coming out of each instructor, this means over 2,000 new pilots were introduced to ultralight aviation yearly. This also meant, because of the low cost involved in operations, each local area could have their own local flying site. These sites would then be home to new students, new aircraft owners, and the Center for Ultralight Aircraft Activity. This would then spin off into aircraft maintenance and repair, engine service and repair, and accessory sales. The more students, the more aircraft are sold, the more services needed, the more accessories are sold, and you get a little bit of repair here and there. They all feed off one another. But the first part of the equation was affordable aircraft, both for the individual and the flight training facility. If a facility can't afford to buy, own, and operate an aircraft, then it can't afford to train. If there is no training, then the other parts of the puzzle do not materialize.
So what happened? Well, Sport Pilot happened. Why? Now that is the million dollar question because that's probably what it's cost us to date. Why and how was the light sport aircraft movement able to take over the identity of ultralight aviation? Why were pilots who only want to fly, fly single place aircraft but with an adjustment in weight to allow for greater, greater safety now given an ultimatum by the associations that represented their interest? Become sport pilots and have your planes go through as experimental light sport aircraft or lose the ability for you to fly them and them to fly. That's right. As of January 2010, a number of pilots associations agreed that if an aircraft did not get through the program by January 2010, it would be grounded and there would be no way to get it flying again. Now take a minute and think about this. Ultra air aircraft have been with us since the early 70s. Even you take a figure of a thousand aircraft a year since 75, which is only about 20 aircraft per state. In 2010, you would have approximately 35,000 ultralight aircraft sitting in backyards, barns, grass strips, and airfields scattered around the U.S. Now, let's say these aircraft were all conventional aircraft, Cubs, Mustangs, Taylor crafts, whatever. Do you think for one minute that any pilot's association in their right mind would be able to justify to their members who own these planes that is, as of 2010, they would be ground with no legal way of getting them flying again? Yeah, I know a Cub is probably worth 50 to 80,000, while an Ultralight is 5 to 8,000. But to the guy or gal that owns the Ultralight, the reason they have it is because they can't afford an $80,000 aircraft. The loss to them is probably greater than loss to the guy that owns a Cub, because if he owns and flies a Cub, he can probably afford the loss. The owner of the Ultralight didn't have the financial resources to start with, and the loss to him in both time, energy, and money is probably the last straw to his or her dreams of flying. But the ball is, is rolling down the hill, being pushed by some pilots association. It isn't slowing down. Instead, it is crushing everything in its path. Remember that little flight training facility, training three or four students a year? Well, its owner could once build, repair, and maintain his own aircraft. As the sport pilot ball rolled in, a plane that he could once buy and build as a kit for training would probably cost him about $30,000. Under sport pilot, it is to be factory built. Compare that to the $100,000 price tag of the majority of light sport aircraft. My figures say it more than triples the cost. Before Sport Pilot, a school could maintain their own aircraft. They could put whatever floats, prop, instruments, engines they wanted on it. Under Sport Pilot, they can't change a nut or bolt or instrument without the factory first approving it. If you consider yourself a part of, a, of grassroots aviation, which is and always will be defined as ultralight aviation, it's time you get off your fat asses and started lobbying EAA, USUA, AS. C, FA, AOP, and every other group that represents aviation. The time to do something is not now. It was 10 years ago when the idea of Sport Pilot was first introduced. Think of Sport Pilot like a drug gang that has moved into your neighborhood. Only two things can happen. They will either take over your neighborhood and you will lose everything you and your family have worked for your life for. Or you start grouping together with your neighbors and fight back. You be judged.